Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, uh, broadcasting from the Bulwark offices in Washington, D.C., as opposed to being in my basement in Wisconsin. So this is this is kind of a, a banner morning. And uh, our guest today, uh, returning to the podcast, Catherine Rampell, a columnist for the Washington Post, who's talking to us from rain-soaked New York. So uh, good morning, Catherine. Good morning. Hey, before we get into uh, the economics and finance stuff, which I'm hoping you can explain to me, because actually, um, there's a, there's a lot out there that I I look at and I go, okay, I, I really need someone to explain this stuff to me. I want to talk about the billionaire tax and all of this other stuff. But could we just talk about the weird? I don't I don't want to say book banning, book burning rage that's taking place uh, in in America's uh, schools, or but it that it is actually that. I mean, I said I don't want to call it book banning. But the uh, Glenn Youngkin campaign in Virginia is closing out its campaign by putting up an ad with a mother telling this horrific story about the trauma that her son experienced when he read this really terrible book. Let's just play a little bit of this ad. As a parent, it's tough to catch everything. So when my son showed me his reading assignment, my heart sunk. It was some of the most explicit material you can imagine. I met with lawmakers. They couldn't believe what I was showing them. Their faces turned bright red with embarrassment. They passed bills requiring schools to notify parents when explicit content was assigned. It was bipartisan. It gave parents a say, the option to choose an alternative for my children. I was so grateful. But then Governor Terry McAuliffe Mm. vetoed it Mm. twice. He doesn't think parents should have a say. He said that. He shut us out. Glenn Youngkin, he listens. He understands. Parents matter. Yeah. Okay. So that that's been a big theme in the campaign. I don't know that this ad might be effective, except that the, the mom in this doesn't mention that her son was a high school senior at the time. (laughs) And that the book in question was assigned as part of his advanced placement English curriculum was Beloved, the vivid and wrenching novel about slavery in America that won the 1988 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. So a little bit, you know, detail, a little you know, important detail, Toni Morrison's classic novel Beloved. And she's been agitating to remove this from her son's school because it gave him nightmares. I, Catherine, I'm old enough to remember when we called people like this snowflakes. <laughs> I know you would think from the tenor of that ad and the lack of details in that ad that we were talking like about like a nine year old who had been, you know, forced to read Kama Sutra or something. Who knows? And no, it's, you know, probably a 17 or 18 year old kid um, asked to read one of the seminal works of American literature. And look, there, there are adult themes in Beloved. Um, I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but this is an AP class. My understanding is he could have opted out on his own anyway. Um, But the idea of, um, you know, this being the line that was crossed is, is just something else, which is part of the reason why I think that this long-term conversation um, coming partly from the right about cancel culture um, is somewhat in in bad faith. Uh, I mean, I, I, I am concerned about free speech and I've written about times when political correctness, which is what we think, I think we used to call it, had gone amok. But, you know, the idea that this is coming from the left, that, that illiberalism is exclusively coming from the left, I should say, is just nonsense. There are illiberal tendencies, uh, uh, t- uh, tendencies towards censorship um, among both left and right. And, and there should be some principles here, right, about um, maintaining free discourse, not banning books, uh, particularly if you we're talking think. about, you would, yeah, think, you would think, particularly yeah. if we're talking about an AP class, AP English class. Well, I mean, um, you, you, know, you, you mentioned this. I mean, the the debate that we had when people would, we used to hear from the right, you know, they, this was the F your feelings uh, crowd, right? And we we can't have, we, we can't make decisions about what we read or what we say based on someone's feelings. And now that's been turned completely on its head, right? The, the, this, well, the, this the, young the, the man's your, feelings. Yeah. 
Yes. The, the, well, the F your feelings uh, message, I, I think, became somewhat obsolete long ago, not just in the context of books, right? I mean, the whole reason why we're ha- we have all of these fake audits of elections is because people feel like their, <laughs> their, you know, their side was betrayed in, in, in the election despite any evidence. The whole reason why you know, we have to tiptoe around encouraging people to get vaccinated you know, is because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. So uh, again, you know, we, we heard this message from the right for many years about prioritizing facts, uh, feelings don't matter, you know, make fun of the snowflakes, et cetera, when much of our political discourse is structured around avoiding hurting the feelings um, of people on the right, as it is on uh, for people on the left. Again, I, I think there should be some principles articulated well, here, <laughs> well, we, um, but we that's did, not where we are. Well, I mean, the, the, those principles were, you know, principles of academic freedom, liberal democracy, but I think what we're finding out is that those uh, those principles are very, very fragile and very vulnerable when you have the illiberalism, you know, hitting it from from both sides. So let's let's talk about um, the you know, politics, the economy, finance, all of these things. You have a provocative column in the Washington Post today. Uh, Democrats' risky strategy showed they never learned their lessons from Obamacare. And it's interesting you should write that because I, I was just thinking yesterday how much this year has kind of a 2009 vibe to it that uh, the, you have Democrats who think that they're going to push through their their agenda and that somehow once they pass it, people will you know, find out what was in the bill um, and will support it. So just talk to me a little bit about this, uh, about you know why you think their strategy is so risky and, and what the lessons were that they didn't learn from Obamacare. I think the number one part of their strategy that I'm concerned about is this idea that the way to shrink down the scale of their ambitions, or at least to get a lower budget score on their reconciliation bill, you know, their their welfare state expansion slash climate uh, initiative bill, is to try to do everything and just have everything expire within mm-hmm. a few years, uh, rather than prioritizing a few programs that they want to do well, that are fully funded for either permanently or for the full 10 years. Um, and I've been writing a bunch about that, you know, that, that set of alternatives. Do they do fewer things better, more things worse? Um, and I'm on the fewer things better team. So mm-hmm. I'll, 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 I'll put that out up front. But I think the lesson that many progressives who are on the just do everything part way and have it expire and, and count on it to be renewed, um, I, I think that the lesson that they think they learned from Obamacare was, well, Obamacare was was politically resilient, mm-hmm. right? Republicans kept trying to kill it and failed. It is still the law of the land. And despite efforts to repeal it, Republicans were never able to do so. That's what they think the takeaway from the Obamacare fight was. Whereas I think it's basically the opposite. Uh, yes, Republicans did try many times to repeal Obamacare and claim and came extremely close to mm-hmm. succeeding. In fact, there was, you know, just one thumbs down from a dying senator away <laughs> from Obamacare being killed. And it's important to note that the default for that law was that if Congress did nothing, the law continued. And in this case, the default would be if Congress does nothing, the programs end. And that what what is the status quo really matters here because it's a much heavier lift to get Congress to take action than to take inaction, right? So I, I just think it's extremely risky for Democrats to to assume, hey, these things will prove really mm-hmm, popular, mm-hmm. and therefore future Congresses will have no choice but to keep them going, even if those are Republican-led Congresses. I think you know that, that is not what we learned from the ACA. And, and there are a number of other lessons, too, I think, from that experience, including that given the current political climate, if there are problems in the law, whether they're you know minor drafting errors or bigger structural flaws, at which which is almost inevitable. Any big sprawling piece of legislation like this is going to have some glitches in it. With Obamacare, basically, um, there there were no, it was very difficult, I should say, to get through what is what is generally considered a relatively routine piece of legislation called a technical corrections bill, yes. which historically Congress has not 
had not really had a problem doing. It's like, look, maybe we didn't sign on to the original bill, but we realize, you know, both sides realize like there's some stupid flaw, like we should have the, the, the law work as it was intended to work. We'll fix some glitches. That did not happen or at least it was very difficult for any kind of, you know, again, technical corrections to get through with with the ACA. The same thing with the Republican tax bill, by the way. Democrats were not cooperative there. And so I think the assumption should be this time around that with this piece of legislation, which does many, many more things than the ACA did, there will be problems, there will be drafting errors, and they won't be fixable, <laughs> at least not through legislation. So it's really, really important to get all of those nitty gritty design details right up front. Again, there inevitably there will be some glitches, but get as much of it right as you can. And that's not really what their focus is. It's like we just got to get something through. I, I I really was struck by this part of your your column, you know, where you're pointing out how important it is to get the nitty gritty details um, right up front because this is their one shot to assure the programs are bulletproof. And you're right; they mustn't jam through a bunch of half baked proposals as they are reportedly now considering, including a not yet stress test billionaire tax, and then cross their fingers that defects will be fixed later. I mean, so y- your advice is obviously correct, and obviously it feels like they're going to ignore it mainly because of the speed with which they're they're operating. Well, it's really hard to tell if they're operating quickly or slowly. To be fair, right? I mean, it's sort they've sort of been working on this for months, and we keep on hearing from Democratic leadership that a deal is imminent. And if that's true, yes, I would be very concerned about how well thought through many of these proposals are because like all of a sudden they're tearing up a bunch of the tax increases and they're looking for other sources of money, including this billionaire tax, and they haven't really thought that through. If, in fact, this doesn't pass in or, you know, they don't even agree to the framework basically in the next week or so, which I think is more likely, then maybe they would actually put the thought into the design. I don't know, but I want to pressure them to do that, right? I mean, I think that they want some sort of sense of urgency because they want to show that they've delivered this quickly. But my fear is that if, in fact, they deliver this quickly, or at least imminently, then they won't have thought through all of these things that they need to think through. Well, and part of it, though, is let's talk about this billionaire tax, because uh, this seems to have just I won't say it came out of nowhere, but it certainly popped up, uh, you know, to the top of the agenda very, very quickly when it became clear they might not have had the votes to raise the taxes. So my understanding about this billionaire tax is that it would tax about a thousand billionaires, it would would affect only a small number of people, but it would also tax their unrealized capital gains. So this is the closest thing we've seen to a wealth tax. Um, can you tell me about, you know, why you say it's not stress test and well, it's not, we don't know all of the details yet. Yeah. Uh, that's part of it. And, and it's not quite a wealth tax. It's just, a, it's just a tax on how much your assets went up over the previous year. Mm-hmm. If you are a billionaire, or I think if you have, um, a hundred million dollars in income for three consecutive years. Um, and, and basically what that means is if you're, uh, stock portfolio uh, went up year over year. You get e- even if you didn't sell those stocks, uh, so you didn't. The, the technical term is you didn't realize the income. Yeah. You still get taxed as if you did. It's a pretty significant change in the philosophy of taxation. Though. I yes, mean, people will look at that and go, "Oh, that's an interesting precedent." Yes. They, okay. So, and it may be very difficult to administer too. It's it's relatively easy if you're talking about a publicly traded security like a stock, right? We know how much uh, Microsoft stock went up or down in value year over year, or Amazon stock or whatever. But then there's the question of what about an art collection? What about a closely held business? Mm-hmm. Things that are harder to value. And it's not that there's no experience doing those kinds of valuations. The IRS does it when people die, when there's an estate tax that's due, but there are like really lengthy fights, um, with the, uh, tax attorneys and accountants, uh, you know, kept on the payroll of these very, very wealthy people over, you know, how much is this, this art collection or whatever worth. And so I think it's going to be harder to administer than it first sounds. And, And there may be ways around that, like they could wait until the thing is actually sold and then, you know, have like a little bit of a fee for 
the deferral of, you know, waiting for to sell it, but it's complicated and boring, frankly. But, um, but my fear is that the IRS will just be outgunned on all mm. of this. And that, and that basically the billionaires that we are trying to soak, uh, will be able to, to get out of paying this tax. I mean, I think it's, it's, discouraging enough to me that we've now narrowed the eligible population for for tax increases as much as we have. My feeling is, you know, if you want to propose a Scandinavian style welfare state, you should look at how those welfare states are usually funded and they have a much broader tax base. You know, the middle class pays much more in taxes in in Denmark or or wherever, in part because they have a VAT and they have other tools. Um, Whereas here in the United States, Democrats are arguing for this very generous welfare state, but saying, oh, well, we're going to only, it's only going to be funded by the rich. Don't worry. And who counts as rich? Well, first it was like only people making over $400,000 a year, which is less than 5% of the population. Now it's like not even those people. Now it's just the billionaires. And you you keep on narrowing it's smaller the ta- and smaller. Yeah, the tax this you know, who counts as rich is like a vanishingly small sliver of the population. And I'm not even sure that that this tax will be effective. I, I, it may not be constitutional either, which is a whole or the courts may not find it as constitutional, which is a separate I, I, issue. I guess I'm a little bit puzzled by all of this because the Democrats, at least as you point out, on 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 their spending plans are, you know, sweeping and incredibly ambitious. And yet when it comes to taxation, you would think that this would be a moment uh, for Democrats to unite around, you know, at least repealing the Trump tax cuts. And I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm guessing that the raising taxes on millionaires and billionaires polls rather well across yes. the board. I mean, right now we, we have this massive wealth inequality. I was in a meeting yesterday. Somebody was talking about, you know, the rich, the rich have so much money. The money is stupid right now. It's just everywhere. And I do think that there's resentment about um, the there's resentment about the inequality of wealth, but also there's there's just a legitimate problem that things are incredibly skewed. So this would seem to be a, the perfect moment, wouldn't it, to go and raise taxes on, I don't know, people who make more than a million dollars a year, and yet and that's not a, that's a non-starter. It's kind of a, a you want to talk about a lost opportunity from the, from the Democratic point of view, and I'm just, just stepping back and thinking, yeah. this is what you'd expect Democrats to do at this moment in history with this. So why are they not as ambitious on taxes as they are on spending? Uh, so you're right. It is very popular um, historically and right now to say, let's raise taxes on the rich. But rich is never defined, right? Rich, I think rich always means someone richer than me. <laughs> when people are responding to that survey question. And there are a few things that are going on. One is presumably donors. I don't know how much influence they are having on particular elements of the tax the rich or tax corporations proposal. I, I assume there's a lot happening behind closed doors. Many of the things that Biden had proposed to pay for his ambitious agenda, even at, again, I, as I said, he very narrowly defined who he could raise taxes on as only people making over four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Even within the options that he kept on the table, Democrats have ruled some of them out. Um, things like you know completely closing the carried interest loophole, etc. Um, and I think. Some of what's going on is donors. Some of what's going on is that the Democratic political base has changed. And so it's hmm. become more highly educated, more professional class, more high income. And as a result, it's a little bit dicier for Democratic lawmakers to say, I agree to raise this tax that I know will hit some of my constituents. I mean, even uh, AOC. She of the famous tax the rich gown at the Met Gala. Yes, um, which we all remember. Yes. A few days later, she made a comment where she said something like, oh, they want you to think that when we say tax the rich, we mean doctors and lawyers. No, 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 no. We mean people with hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Mm. And I, I respect what doctors and lawyers do. I think they deserve to be well compensated. But, but many doctors, for example, are... Very, very highly compensated. You sure. know, that's the profession that I think that's most likely to be in the top 1%. So, um, again, I'm not saying – whenever I write about this, I'm like, doctors actually make a lot of money. I get tons of hate mail from doctors, and I'm saying I'm, – I'm not saying you shouldn't make lots of money. I'm just saying you are objectively at the top part of the, the, <laughs> the income distribution. If even AOC is saying you don't deserve 
you don't count as rich and therefore your taxes won't go up. That really narrows See, the base making, who can pay for all of this. You, you're but presumably those are her constituents. Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting point because I think a lot of people's reaction is it's all Kirsten Cinema. So Kirsten Cinema wouldn't vote in favor of this. But what you're saying is, is that the reluctance may be more widespread in the Democrats. And, and I do wonder whether or not sometimes uh, Manchin and Kirsten Cinema are, are taking shots for other senators or sort of who are sort of in the background, who have some of the same concerns, but are letting them take the bullets? I think that there is no question that Cinema and Manchin have the biggest objections to much of the Democratic agenda. But even before we knew what those objections were, Democrats were taking some of these revenue raising tools off the table. So I mentioned that some of what Biden had proposed to pay for all of this um, got ruled out, like closing the carried interest loophole. They narrow it. This this is um, basically uh, a special tax break that's enjoyed mostly by private equity and um, and hedge funds. So, you know, very high income people. Biden wanted to treat capital income the same way as earned income and and raise the tax rates for capital gains so that they're equivalent. The top tax rate is equivalent to that for earned income. And Democrats said no. And this is this was these were decisions made by the House, House Democrats. Um, many of these negotiations had had happened prior to cinema and mansion kind of laying down their own demands. So this has been going on for a while. And and beyond that, there is a major tax break for high income people that a, a number of Democrats from higher tax states like New Jersey, New York right. and, and California have been urging the party to include in this bill. And that's something called the state and local tax deduction oh, cap. I'm, I'm from Wisconsin. We we felt that one too. Right. And and I think the issue there is if you, if you look at the actual numbers, the people who stand to benefit from repealing the cap are overwhelmingly the very, very high income. Mm-hmm. Um, because so people making over five hundred thousand dollars a year, a million dollars a year, they get most of the benefits, uh, or they would get most of the benefits if you repealed this tax break. But there is a perception that if you live in a high tax state, you would benefit. You know, even if you're middle class, you would benefit too. That's not actually true most of the time, because when Republicans passed their tax law that put that cap in place, they did a bunch of other things that gave the middle class tax cuts that offset. Hmm. the SALT deduction. So like the the standard deduction doubled. So most people who who are like, oh, it stinks that I can't deduct my huge property taxes, they wouldn't be itemizing anyway. Uh, Or at least a large fraction of them wouldn't be itemizing anyway. It wouldn't affect them. But they, the tax code is so complex and so opaque that it's really hard for people to, to understand like which line of the code affects them how. And so there is this perception that getting rid of the salt cap would, you know, benefit all of these middle class people when in fact, no, because of all the other things that are going on in the tax code, it doesn't, it would mostly benefit almost all of the, or most of the dollars of tax cuts would go to the very high income. But you have a bunch of Democrats who represent um, districts in New Jersey or wherever, where they have a lot of high income constituents who are hurting from it. And they're putting their foot down and saying, I'm not going to vote for this bill unless you give my guys a tax cut. So so, so let's talk about some of the other things that are in these bills. And, and I was, as, as, you, as you were just talking, I was, I was thinking about you know, one of the dangers the Democrats have is that because these bills are so complicated and it's so difficult to figure out um, some of the details, that they are not going to get some of the credit that they think they are going to. And I'm, I'm remembering back... Uh, to the Obama years where Obama once complained, you remember this, where he said, you know, I I cut everybody's taxes and nobody knows it. They had cut the payroll tax. And I think I think Obama and the Democrats got zero credit for some of the tax cuts that uh, that they pushed through during their stimulus package. But but there are some complicated things in the in this as well. So let's can we just talk about the 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 child tax credit, which I am fascinated by. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think one of the big disappointments of this year was that if there was any area in which you I, you had the potential for having a bipartisan compromise, it was on the child tax credit, but that didn't happen. 
Um, you wrote a piece about the work requirement. Mansion wants a work requirement for the child tax credit. Um, I gather you think that's a bad idea. Yes, I do. First of all, in my view, the most valuable contribution of this expanded tax credit, as Democrats put in a one-year version of an, of an expansion of this uh, child tax credit, just to so listeners know what we're talking about. So now the tax credit is bigger. It's given out monthly rather than once a year, and it is available to the poorest of the poor um, through a basically it's it's called fully refundable. Even yeah. if you don't make enough earnings um, to have a, a tax bill to offset, you still get the money. Um, it's so anyway, the, the part of all of that that I think is most valuable is that it's helping the poorest of the poor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice that it helps the middle class. Great. Kids are expensive. I think we should treat households um, that make, you know, $60,000 and have two kids as having a very different set of expenses from a household that makes $60,000 and has no kids, for example. Um, But I think the most valuable piece of all of this is that it's lifting almost half of children who are in poverty out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And if you add work requirements to that, it's not really clear how, you know, logistically how that would function. Maybe it just means that you have to have tax liabilities to offset. So you get rid of that full refundability. Um, you know, that's the technical version of it. Maybe it means you, you have households document whether or not they are working. So you don't just look at their taxes. You look at, you know, like how many hours are they working or if they're not working, are they applying for jobs? That's how a lot of other safety net programs work. For example, in the last few years under the Trump administration, a number of states, decided to put work requirements in place for Medicaid. Yeah. So as a condition of getting Medicaid, you would have to prove you are working or looking for work or volunteering or some other subset of things. And um, those kinds of ideas are relatively popular. Uh, I think in the United States, we do have a, a strongly ingrained value system that you know says we want people to be working. People should um, you know, show that they are contributing to society as a condition of getting society, you know, societally funded benefits. And I think all of that, you know, those are va- valid objectives. The problem is when, when the rubber meets the road, how do you actually tell if people are, are working or are not working and how much, it, how much like red tape do you have to put in place to confirm people are supposedly deserving versus undeserving? It's really complex. It's very expensive for the state to administer, and you end up kicking off a lot of people yeah. who are eligible um, from those benefits. You know, in the Medicaid work requirements um, example, a lot of people who were working lost their Medicaid because it was too difficult to prove it. In the case of the child tax credit, if you are demanding that people prove they're working, um, A, you'll probably end up um, you know, disqualifying people who are eligible because it's complex. And B, there are populations that cannot work because they are disabled. In many cases, they're grandparents who have taken care. The grandparents, care. I thought was interesting, the point you made about grandparents. Right. So this is, you know, this is a particularly sympathetic population who would be affected by this. As a result of the opioid crisis and then COVID, there's a, a surging number of these families where grandparents have taken over custody and care of their grandchildren because either the parents have passed away or they're, you know, not in a position to provide a safe household for their, for their own kids. And in those families, they've already been through a lot, obviously, to get to that point, probably there's been a fair amount of trauma. But in those families, it's also much harder for the grandparents to work because they're older. They're more likely to be disabled. Mm-hmm. Um, if they've retired, even if they want to go back to work, who's going to hire them <laughs> in many parts of the country? So you just have to kind of think through in practice, what would it mean if, in fact, we added work requirements as a condition of this benefit? However mm-hmm. nice it sounds in the abstract, you're going to end up depriving lots of families who could use this benefit of the benefit, whether they're disabled grandparents. And I, I profiled one family in West Virginia, of all places, uh, in, in that recent piece. But there are other families, too, you know, that 
cycle in and out of employment, often for reasons beyond their control, like they don't have childcare or whatever. Um, and why are you punishing the kids? That's, that's the end result, right? Like you end up punishing the kids cause the, cause like a 65 year old grandma. Well, and you, you also make it, you, 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 you also make it so much more complicated, um, as opposed to, I mean, I think the, the elegance of the, the, ch- the refundable child tax credit was, was simple. There was no bureaucracy. There were no hoops to jump through. Um, and, and now they've, you know, vast, well, this would vastly complexify it. Yes. Yes. So on this issue of, of, of work, one of the great mysteries that everybody is trying to puzzle out is why so many people are not going back to work. Wherever I go, there are the ads for the $15 an hour jobs at McDonald's plus 401k plus college tuition, and yet they can't find the workers. What, what is, do you have an operative theory of what's going on, why there are you know, millions of people who have just opted not to come back into the workforce despite the fact that there are so many jobs out there? There are a lot of likely contributors, and we don't know the exact mix. But among them, a lot of people have retired early. You can look at the numbers and you can see there was just this surge in retirements during COVID, probably partly because jobs were less safe for older workers. Um, maybe people lost their jobs early in the crisis and just said, to heck with it, I'm, I'm done. Um, also, asset values went up. So if you're a boomer and you're on the verge of retirement, you now have this huge, you know, this nice nest egg in your in your house, and you can afford to retire. So there's the the retirement bucket. There's the lots of other people are still dealing with childcare issues, with transit issues, you know, all these other kinds of disruptions in the conditions that make it possible to work. Schools have reopened, but they're still sometimes, you know. Um, having kids go into quarantine and things like that. Um, So there's that. There's the fact that for a lot of people, they may worry that it's not safe for them to work. Uh, And, you know, maybe they can get vaccinated, but their kids can't, et cetera. They're going to hold off. People are sitting, even people who are not of retirement age are sitting on huge amounts of savings. Um, And so maybe they have a little bit more of a financial cushion. And that's partly because asset values have gone up and partly because of government policy, right? I mean, there were there was huge, a lot of money out there. Yeah. yeah, huge transfers. And we can debate whether they were good or bad or well targeted or not. But unemployment insurance, um, you know, which is obviously a very divisive issue, but it does mean that people have more of this financial cushion. They can they can wait out a little bit longer. And of course, the stimulus checks that went out. Um, and then there are other factors like immigration. So immigration, um, Hmm. visas issued went way down, way down. There were like more than a a million fewer work eligible visas issued, I think in the first year and a few months after COVID than the comparable period prior to COVID. And so that means fewer people taking seasonal jobs. We had fewer skilled workers. So that has ripple effects throughout the economy too. And and immigration levels had been falling even before COVID for other Trump-related reasons. But then you had this huge plunge and those are missing people from the workforce. Is there also a cult? Obviously, all of these things are are playing into, but is is there a cultural shift going on now where where, where people are just changing their their kind of their philosophy and their priorities of life and, and rethinking uh, the importance of jobs and, and careers. And I, I know that's difficult to quantify, but how does that play into all of this? So we have survey evidence suggesting that people's priorities have changed, uh, how much they value the the work part of their work-life balance has, has changed, and they've decided they want to spend more time with their families, they want less time commuting, et cetera. It's really hard to parse that in the the data that we have on jobs, you know, it's hard to know to what extent are people staying out of the, like you can see how, how much the workforce declined, but how many of those people are doing it because they've changed their priorities versus um, any of these other things that we've talked about. But yeah, I mean, anecdotally, this definitely seems to be true that a lot of people are reevaluating how they want to spend their time. And 
all of those other factors that I talked about, including having a stronger financial cushion, I think gives people more breathing room to to step back and say, maybe I am going to take a little break from the workforce now. I'm burnt out. Um, I have a toddler at home or whatever. I'm going to just sit out the job market for a little while. The job market I hear is hot. So if I decide to go back, there will be opportunities waiting for me. And so these these different factors interact um, where people's values may have changed, but also the conditions of the job market allow them to act on those changing values. You know, they, they don't have to necessarily um, feel obligated to stick with a dead end job or a job that doesn't pay well, that they're really unhappy with, that's making their home life miserable, et cetera. Um, they and they can, have leverage. I mean, they have they leverage. Have some to, leverage. To, you know, and, 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 you know, the whole idea of, you know, do you have to go into the office all the time? I mean, obviously, I, I feel like we've, We've hit this massive threshold where, where people are going, you know what, I am just not wearing a suit. I'm not driving down um, you know, every single day commuting to an office. I, I like working from home. I would like to have a hybrid circumstance. And it feels like it, like we're just not going to go back to the way it was in the before times. Yeah, it's really hard to know what normal post-pandemic, if yeah, there is a post-pandemic, what, is right. Right. <laughs> what it would look like. And we've seen these geographic changes as well, where it looks like, you know, for a long time, there had been this really strong attraction to moving to inner cities, denser areas where amenities were really close by. The pandemic seems to have reversed that. We don't know how temporarily or how permanently, you know, people moving to the suburbs or the exurbs, which is more possible if you're not tied to your office, Uh, but not all occupations allow, enable people to work remotely. So that's an option for, you know, more often white collar, Mm -hmm. uh, more educated workers. Um, But yeah, it's hard to say what's going to happen going forward. And I think a lot of employers are trying to sort this out right now with their workers. Workers may, you know, maybe don't want to go back to the office, but employers want them to come back to the office, depending on what the, what the company might be because they think it's, you know, they want to be able to monitor people or they think it's useful for, um, you know, for that interplay of ideas to happen with people in person. And so it's not clear how it's going to shake out going forward, um, particularly if workers continue to have a lot of bargaining power here. Maybe they can make stronger demands about what kinds of conditions they want, not only on their wages and their benefits, but where they are physically working. But then the flip, the flip side of that is, you know, if anybody can work remotely, then that means you're, you're not only competing for your job with the people in your narrow geographic area, everywhere, everywhere. So in the long run, maybe that'll weigh on worker power. We don't know. So I've, I've saved the biggest question for, for last, um, and, and, and it's the question that I think is going to hang over both the politics and the economy for a long time. What is your sense about the danger of persistent inflation? Obviously, we've had a spike of inflation and there's been a debate back and forth. Is it going to be a temporary spike? Is it going to be long term? How worried should we be about persistent inflation? If you had asked me this question six months ago, my response would have been something like, I'm not worried. Hmm. You know, these are temporary bottlenecks that will work themselves out. We have a vaccine now. It's just a matter of time before people go back to the workforce. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like the economy can sort of power on again. It was, it was in a coma and now it's, you know, it's waking up from the coma and initially there are some problems, but then it'll work themselves out. That's the way I felt. Yeah. And, I'm more pessimistic now. The bottlenecks have persisted for much longer than expected, partly because of Delta, partly because of resistant, you know, reluctance to get vaccinated, um, among other issues, partly because we are actually just buying more stuff than we were before. There's been this shift in what consumers buy away from services, uh, partly because it's, you know, not as safe to eat in a restaurant or to travel or whatever. So we're buying more 
physical stuff. And just as it's harder for the stuff to get made, we're asking for more of it. (laughs) So there's this even bigger mismatch between demand and supply, and that's causing all sorts of stresses on the system. And the thing that I'm most worried about is even if the sources behind the price spikes are transitory. Like it's it's just a matter of like reopening pains and getting things back online, whatever. Even if it is transitory, if it starts to affect expectations, that's what economists yeah. really worry about. Meaning that I preemptively raise my prices because I'm worried. I see everything else rising in price and and I don't want to you know, end up on the losing end of all of that. So I, you know, I see my inputs getting more expensive. I believe that they are going to stay more expensive, you know, whether like I'm a restaurant and it's, it's food costs, let's say. So what, what, what is the impact of government spending in fiscal policy? Because of course this will have tremendous political implications and polls would suggest that voters are inclined to be more skeptical of say the Democrats big spending plans because they think it's inflationary now. So how does that play into this inflationary spiral. We are seeing inflation in major economies throughout the world, even ones that did not have as generous a a fiscal intervention as we did for COVID. So I just want to be clear about that. So these bottlenecks are affecting everywhere. They're affecting, you know, Europe and the UK and Asia and elsewhere. However, our inflation has been higher even than those other places that are also dealing with relatively high inflation. And that seems at least partly due to fiscal policy, you know, because we sent out these checks, we had very generous safety net responses. And again, you know, that saved a lot of people, I think, from very difficult times, gave them more breathing room, all those other good things we talked about. But it does mean that there's more more dollars out there chasing fewer goods um, or, or even a slightly higher amount of goods for that matter. Uh, so fiscal policy, I think, has played some role. You know, it'll be uh, there'll be dissertations written on on how much. Um, and so I think it's reasonable to say, yeah, some of the stuff that Congress has done has probably contributed somehow. If we're talking about what Democrats are proposing mm-hmm. um, going forward, it really depends on what the final deal is. If, in fact, the bill is paid for, which is what Biden said it would be, then I'm really not worried about the, you know, this this big expansion of the safety net as as um, large as the number looks contributing to inflation. It's going to it's going to be over 10 years. And if it's paid for, you're not actually pumping more money into the economy. If, in fact, it's not paid for, um, I think that's a little riskier. And as we were just discussing, Democrats have gotten cold feet. <laughs> on a lot of those revenue raisers. So I think no matter what the final contours of the bill look like, you are going to hear Republicans say, look at how much Democrats spent. um, And that's responsible for inflation. And I think that would distort what's actually going on. But I think it is reasonable to say that if they don't design the policy well, it could have some minor contribution. Now, there are economists who, you know, say, in fact, the legislation could reduce inflationary pressures because, like, for example, housing costs have been going up. If the bill creates more affordable housing, that should reduce inflate, you know, price pressures on houses. So there are elements that could be disinflationary, but it's the devil's in the details. It depends on what they do. Now it's, it's technical, it's complicated. All of that stuff is going to go over the heads of most voters. What's going to matter is what the dominant narrative is. And you can already see Republicans putting that together as you should, you know, you see the gas price going up. Um, yes. That's Thank Biden's you, Joe fault. Biden. Right. Yeah, it's not Joe Biden's it's, fault, but yeah. that's what they'll hear. Yeah, I mean, and, and that is the bumper sticker. Um, Catherine Rimpel, thank you so much for all of your time this morning and coming on the podcast. I appreciate it very much. Fascinating discussion. My pleasure. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>